Hello, my name is Jalen Eberly and I am the curator of fossil vertebrates at the University of Colorado Museum of Natural History and we are located in the Paleontology Hall at the museum right now. Um, I am also a professor in geological sciences here at CU Boulder. I work on fossil mammals and paleoclimate. And most of my research is in, uh, in the high Arctic region. I do a lot of work in the Canadian Arctic and in Alaska. So today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about my research in the Arctic regions on fossil mammals. I, so as a fossil mammal person, what I work on are pri primarily their teeth. Um, teeth are your hardest part in your body and your teeth are covered in enamel which is basically a mineral. It's the mineral hydroxyapatite, so it's very hard, and it's the most likely part of you to become a fossil. And so that's what most of us who work on fossil mammals study. We've, we study teeth. The other really important thing about teeth is that uh, for fossil mammals, they're very diagnostic, which means that if I were to go down to the Denver Zoo and crank open the mouth of a lion and peek in there, I could tell you that it's a lion just by looking at its teeth. And primarily its cheek teeth, so in this region right here. Um, I would not need the rest of the body of the lion to tell you that it's a lion. Now I would say do not try this at home or at your local zoo. I do a lot of my field work in the Canadian High Arctic and uh, the island that I've worked on the most in the High Arctic is Ellesmere Island. Um, Ellesmere Island is right next to Greenland and it's very far north, not that far from the North Pole. Um, I have been working up on Ellesmere Island for, oh boy, I started in the late 1990s as a postdoc, but prior to that, my colleagues, Mary Dawson, Malcolm McKenna, and Mac West had been working up there in the 1970s and the 1980s. Um, and so the fossil vertebrates from the Canadian Arctic, um, particularly the, the mammals, and, and I work on Eocene mammals, they're about 50 to 55 million years old, um, those discoveries date back to the mid-1970s and were made by Mary Dawson and, and Mac West. Um, and then I started my work up there in the, in the late 1990s as a postdoc, and then in the 2000s I started leading my own uh, expeditions up there. Um, I just want to point out too though, so, so fossil plants are, are fairly abundant in Eocene rocks in the Arctic, um, and the fossil plant discoveries actually date back to the late 1800s. The 1880s is when um, some of the earliest fossil forests in the Arctic were, were first discovered. So fossil plants date back over a hundred years, and um, whereas fossil mammals, Eocene mammals from the Arctic, are date back to the 1970s. So they're they're really quite recent discoveries in in the High Arctic. So a lot of folks don't realize this, but millions of years ago, so 50 to 55 million years ago in the early Eocene epoch, the Canadian Arctic and parts of Alaska were, were covered in forests. And these were dense forests of a tree um, that's been identified as, as a redwood tree. Most of the trunks are. Um, we know this. How do we know the Arctic was covered in forests? Well, we find petrified tree stumps in the Arctic. Um, my favorite fossil forest is called the Strathcona Fjord Fossil Forest, and it has these beautiful petrified tree stumps, kind of orange in color, sticking out of this coal seam. And you look at it and it's pretty convincing evidence that the Arctic was once covered in forests. A lot of people ask me, how do I get to our field localities in, in the Canadian High Arctic? And I think it's safe to say that um, the aircraft gets smaller as you go north. Uh, and then finally, we're left on foot. But essentially, I take a, a jet up to northern Canada. I then take a, um, a twin otter, which is a small airplane, twin, meaning two engines. Um, I take that from an island called Cornwall. Wallace Island in the Canadian Arctic up to Ellesmere Island and then we land at uh, a fossil, well actually we land at our campsite uh, on Ellesmere Island and from there on 
Basically, once the Twin Otter drops us on Ellesmere Island and we set up our camp, we are going pretty much everywhere on foot at that point. And, and we might go, oh boy, 10 to 15 miles a day where we're walking across the Arctic tundra looking for fossils. You can always tell a paleontologist because their eyes are pointed down to the ground. We could be in the most beautiful, pristine Arctic environment picturesque, but we are always looking down, looking for fossils. Up to this point, and I would say this is largely based on discoveries over the last four plus decades, um, there have been 25 different kinds of fossil mammals from the Eocene rocks uh, on Ellesmere Island, and um, all sorts of interesting mammals. Among the large mammals, probably the most famous of the large mammals that are found in the high Arctic is Corypidon. Um, you can think of Corypidon as looking a bit like a pygmy hippo. He would have been about the size of a pygmy hippo, the shape, and we think the habit, that is, we think Corypidon was a, a semi-aquatic mammal hanging out in the rivers in the Eocene Arctic. Corypidon is one of my favorite mammals, and the reason is because Corypidon is known from um, it's known from North America, mid-latitudes like Colorado and Wyoming, and high latitudes in the Arctic. It's also known from Asia and from Europe. And so Corypidon was one of these big mammals that would have been cruising around uh, the Northern Hemisphere, crossing these land bridges in the Arctic between, uh, first of all, between Asia and North America as well. So super interesting mammal. Um, there are other mammals in the Arctic. Uh, one that I worked on quite closely several years ago is an Arctic taper. And um, the taper was probably about the size of a medium-sized dog. And what's interesting about the taper, like tapers today, it had a trunk, or a, what we would call a proboscis, a short trunk. Um, tapers are interesting because if you think about tapers today, besides the ones that you see in the zoo, um, tapers naturally occur in, um, in tropical environments, tropical distribution. They can live in, in, to, in mountainous areas, but they're within tropical latitudes. Tapers in the Arctic, and people always ask me about those. Are you sure there's tapers in the Arctic? They were actually quite abundant. They were second in terms of abundance next to Corypidon, which is kind of cool. And then there's another big mammal that I always think about with regard to the Arctic um, that I also got to work on, and these are bronotheres. Now, behind me, on this side is a bronotheer skull. The Arctic bronotheers were smaller than the guy behind me. They were about the size of a sheep. But um, bronotheers you can think of as being like a cousin to a rhinoceros today. Bronotheers are completely extinct and throughout the Eocene epoch um, they started relatively small, kind of sheep sized, and then towards the end of the Eocene, they got to the size of the guy behind me, which is about the size of a rhino. So they got bigger as they, they went along. And then they finally went extinct um, at the Eocene and Ligocene boundary, which is about 34 million years ago. In addition to the larger mammals, there are lots of tiny mammals in the Arctic as well. We have um, rodents have been found. We have squirrel-sized carnivores that would have probably been hanging out in these trees. And we also have uh, primates. There are at least two kinds of primate known from the Eocene Arctic localities. Um, and these are being studied right now by my colleague Chris Beard and his students at the University of Kansas. Um, but lots of little mammals as well. So all in all, there are some 25 different kinds of mammals known from the Eocene Arctic. In addition to the mammals from the Eocene High Arctic, there are a number of reptiles known as well. And it's the reptiles that are really giving us some important clues about the climate. Um, one of the first reptiles to be discovered in the Eocene rocks in the Arctic was a jaw of an alligator. And this was discovered by Mary Dawson and Mac West in the mid-1970s. And this introduced the world to Arctic alligators. Um, and and alligators are a really important climate predictor or climate proxy because alligators today really cannot handle a lot of a cold weather. Sub-freezing doesn't do so well. And so when we find alligators in the Arctic, that's pretty big evidence telling us that the Arctic was milder 50 to 55 million years ago than it is today.
Now we also find fossils of turtles in the Arctic. I think there are now nine different families of turtles known from the Eocene Arctic. We have pond turtles, we have softshell turtles, uh, we also have um, giant tortoises. And what they're known from are pieces of their shells. And uh, what's interesting about fossil turtles is you can actually determine the family of the fossil turtle, maybe even lower, um, based on the patterning on their turtle shell pieces. And um, we know then that there are at least nine different kinds of turtle in the Eocene High Arctic based on the study of fossil turtle shell. And those were done by my colleague Howard Hutchison, who is a fossil turtle expert. So in addition to fossil vertebrates, in addition to the, you know, the alligators, the turtles, um, the tapers, all of these things that tend to prefer warmer climates today. The fossil plants tell us a lot about the Eocene Arctic climate. And there have been paleobotanists working up in the Arctic for many decades. Um, mostly it's the Canadian paleobotanists. A couple that I've worked with are Jim Bassinger and Dave Greenwood. And what they've shown is there are lots of different kinds of trees in the Arctic. There were linden, there were alder, there were Let's see, there were grapes. They find leaves of, of fossil grapes. And so I think there were probably some yummy leaves for our coryphodons and, and tapers to eat uh, in the Arctic and fruits as well. And then probably the most famous of the Arctic plants, I would say, are these, these tree trunks, which the paleobotanists think belong to a tree called the Don Redwood, which is a metasequoia. Don Redwood is a special tree. It is a conifer, but it lost its needles. It would lose its needles in the fall and winter. And so we find these fossils of needles in addition to these beautiful tree trunks that are sticking out of these coal seams. And um, there have been paleobotanists that have looked at the spacing and the size of the, the different tree trunks. And um, the tree trunks, first of all, some of them are a meter in diameter. So these are big trees. And based on the diameter, paleobotanists estimate that they grew between 20 and 30 meters high. These are not little trees, these are big trees. And when you look at the spacing of the tree trunks, and if we assume those trees were all growing at the same time, the same generation of trees, we have a forest that probably was as dense as a cypress swamp in the United States today. So if you go down to Alabama or to Texas or to Louisiana and you see these cypress swamps, imagine that in the Arctic 50 to 55 million years ago. So if we put all these fossils together, so the fossil animals, the different kinds of vertebrate animals, the mammals, the alligators, and all of the plants, um, we have a fairly good idea of what we think the Arctic looked like 50 to 55 million years ago during the early Eocene. A um, number of years ago, the American Museum of Natural History in New York did an exhibit called Extreme Mammals, and they featured the Arctic in that exhibit as well, the, the Arctic Eocene, and they reconstructed the Eocene Arctic environment, and it is absolutely beautiful. It is this lush forest, kind of a swamp forest filled with dawn redwood trees. You can see the needles on the trees, and right up there in the foreground is this great big coryphenon munching on plants. Um, and you know, it's just a beautiful reconstruction, and I think quite um, well, it's as accurate as we can get based on the fossils that we found in the Arctic Eocene. Now, what's interesting is if you look at the Eocene Arctic reconstruction and how beautiful and forested and lush it was with all these great animals and plants, and then you compare it to today's Arctic, it, it's, it's night and day. It's, it's very, very different. Um, today's Arctic is treeless. There are, um, when you go up there, you can see for miles, you can see the fjords and the mountains because there are no trees to get in your way, which is a good thing for paleontologists too, to find fossils. And when I'm working in the Arctic, probably the most abundant mammal that I see are the musk oxen. And if you look at a musk oxen, they don't, they, they look like an ice age relic. They belong in the Arctic. They, they belong in cold weather. They're all big fuzzy, uh, fuzzy guys. Um, and they look nothing 
like a corypidon or a taper. So, so I think comparing the Eocene Arctic with today, they're very different environments. The Eocene Arctic is an extinct environment. We don't have anything quite like it today. So I've been working in the Canadian Arctic now for since the late 1990s when I was a postdoc. And um, more recently, in the last few years, I've switched gears. I am still working in the Arctic, but I've started collaborating with colleagues from the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, and we're working on the North Slope of Alaska. Um, I'm working on mammals up there, and my colleagues work on dinosaurs. And I, um, it's a little different for me because the mammals are much older than the mammals from the Canadian Arctic. So the Canadian Arctic was Eocene, post-dinosaurs. Now I'm working on mammals that lived alongside the dinosaurs about 70 million years ago. And it's super fascinating, new environment, and um, the mammals are entirely different from what I've worked on over in the Canadian Arctic, which has been really great. Now, what's interesting about the North Slope of Alaska, if we were to go back 70 million years, to the North Slope or, or to North America, what we would see is that North America was split in half. It was split into western and eastern parts by this great big seaway called the Western Interior Seaway. Now the sites that we're working on in Alaska are, um, they're on the western part of North America at this time, on the western part of the seaway, and they are probably upwards of 80 to 85 degrees north latitude. So the little mammals that I'm studying and the dinosaurs that my colleagues are studying were basically living as far north as you could live 70 million years ago. This, is, this part of Alaska is the northernmost landmass in the world at that time. My colleagues in Alaska have been studying the dinosaurs and there's a huge diversity of dinosaurs. I believe they have over a dozen different kinds of dinosaurs now discovered from the North Slope of Alaska. Um, and these are from the Prince Creek Formation, which is the rock unit that the mammals come from as well. And um, there's everything from hadrosaurs, which are the duck-billed dinosaurs, to tyrannosaurs, to all sorts of dinosaurs in between. So it's a really interesting and diverse dinosaur fauna that's known uh, from the North Slope. The mammals are rarer fossils and just not nearly as well known yet. Um, Part of the reason they're not so well known um, is because the mammal teeth are tiny. We, we also have super tiny uh, dinosaur teeth from Alaska. And in order to find those, what we do is we literally bucket up. We take big buckets of sediment from the Prince Creek Formation, which is along the Colville River in northern Alaska, and we bring these buckets back and we screen wash them using river water in the field. We then haul all those sediments back to the labs and we sort through all those sediments in search of tiny teeth, uh, both dinosaurs and mammals. There have been lots of dinosaur teeth found in this manner and what's really exciting is that a lot of those dinosaur teeth probably belong to baby dinosaurs. So we know there were baby dinosaurs living on the North Slope of Alaska about 70 million years ago during what's called the late Cretaceous period. Um, and most of those teeth, as I said, came from lots of screen washing and work in the lab of sorting that sediment under a microscope. In terms of mammals, the, the mammal fossils are much rarer than the dinosaurs uh, on the North Slope of Alaska. Um, but we're starting to really make some interesting discoveries on them. Um, first of all, they are tiny. And so a single tooth of a mammal from uh, the North Slope of Alaska might be a millimeter long by a millimeter and a half wide. I mean, these are tiny, so you can see why we can't really find them in the field prospecting like we normally would. Um, but they're tiny, and probably the best known right now of the mammals from Alaska is a tiny metatherian. And what a metatherian is, is it's a cousin to today's marsupial mammals. I think when most people think of marsupials, they think of Australia, kangaroos and things like that. But we have a marsupial living in North America, it's the Virginia opossum. And if we could jump back to Alaska 70 million years ago, what we had for a metatherian mammal there would have been a tiny opossum. Uh, and when we look at the size of the teeth, they're so tiny, we can make estimates of the body mass. And basically, the mammals, the little tiny possums that were living in Alaska 70 million years ago, were about the size of a house mouse.
So very tiny, probably living amongst the feet or the understory, certainly, of the dinosaurs and really weren't a big component of that fauna. So in addition to the tiny possum-like mammals that are known from the North Slope, we also find the teeth of this strange mammal called a multi-tuberculate. And I have a model of a multi-tuberculate jaw here with me today. And the teeth that we have found on the North Slope are a lot like this one I'm pointing to here. It's kind of a strange blade-like teeth tooth. And we think that it was probably used for slicing and dicing through insect cuticle. Now on the North slope, the multi-tuberculates are not this big. This is a very large model of a jaw of a multi, but the teeth that we find on the north slope are just a few millimeters in length, and so they're a much smaller mammal than, uh, than what I'm showing here. But that tooth is such a distinctive tooth for a multi-tuberculate that we knew right away when we found one that's what we had. Now I would say probably one of the most important things to point out about the fossil mammals from the North Slope of Alaska is that they were very tiny and they were dwarfed by the dinosaurs that lived alongside them on the North Slope about 70 million years ago. So when you see reconstructions of Alaska at this time, you'll see these great big impressive dinosaurs and maybe in the corner you might see a tiny mammal and, and that's, that's what they were. They, were. they were little guys but nevertheless still very important members of the fauna. Well, stay tuned. We have a number of new species yet to describe from the North Slope, and I'm very excited about that work. Um, I want to thank you for listening today, and uh, I hope that I've been able to teach you something about Arctic mammals that you maybe didn't know about the ancient mammals that used to live in the Eocene and also in the late Cretaceous of, of Arctic regions. And I look forward to hearing your questions.